good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Adria Colomé. I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at the Instituto Robotica. And I'm here to talk about uh, robot motion learning. And when I talk, say robot motion learning, it's not uh, the some of the things that Guillaume has been talking about, about uh, planning planning some uh, actions uh, or, or behavioral trees, or as you as one of the questions was raising, but rather uh, uh, learning locomotion, uh, but not well, not walking uh, for for a robot, but like moving the, your arms, moving um, uh, anything in order to uh, to perform certain action. Now, um, this is done within the project Clotilde, which stands for uh, Cloth Manipulation Learning from Demonstration. And in it, uh, we combine uh, several aspects of uh, like cloth perception, manipulation and planning and learning from demonstration, but also mathematical tools like uh, computational topology in order to do cloth uh, manipulation, which is a very challenging problem. Uh, actually, this, uh, this also includes a lot of uh, mo robot motion, and this is why um, in this topic we have been working hard on, the, on learning robot motion. Now, um, uh, learning the, the, the motion of the robot has been uh, of very of much interest uh, since, the, since the research in robotics began. And initially, um, there was uh, so it was a simple application in which uh, uh, inverse kinematics methods were used in order to uh, follow a straight line or something. But uh, everything has evolved, and we have reached a point where there's uh, like very fancy uh, applications, like uh, here. Uh, uh, this is recent uh, from Boston, Boston Dynamics, and they managed to do uh, like a parkour and acrobatics with a, with a humanoid robot, which is a very challenging uh, problem. And this actually includes uh, thousands and thousands of uh, hours of engineers and researchers uh, working on electronics, working on uh, the robot dynamics, working on the on its kinematics, working on uh, the sensory part, uh, and so on. However, uh, they showed this impressive video, but. Uh, uh, nothing is perfect still, so they still have some uh, failures uh, that we can see here, for instance. So, uh, while the, the video that they published was perfect, uh, they of course had some uh, fails, and because this is this task is so difficult, there's so many things uh, going on here. And again, uh, this is a private company, so the things that they're using are not uh, are not usually public. Uh, actually, the company was bought by Google, I think, in 2013, and then was transferred to a Japanese company to later end up in Hyundai. Um, so uh, the progress of Boston Dynamics uh, is an example of how can we get with, uh, with engineering, but we are not sure how much of this is uh, engineering and how much of this is actually uh, artificial intelligence and learning. And so uh, here today, uh, I will talk a little bit about reinforcement learning and its application to uh, learning robot motion. So usually we have uh, some prior knowledge uh, of the of a task that we want to do. Uh, so we want the robot to do something and uh, we tell the robot, okay, this is what you have to do. And I can teach you, for example, I can, uh, can, uh, I can move you so that you see uh, what, uh, what is what you have to do. And with that, the robot learns what's called a policy. And the policy is uh, basically the robot knowing what to do at uh, the, the current state. So at the current state, the robot uh, detects where he is, uh, how he is, where, how's the environment, or, or uh, whatever is needed for the task, and then re uh, realizes that action uh, or, or provides that output that is expected for, for him. And uh, this output or, or the action that the robot performs must be that uh, with the best expected uh, ex expected performance uh, according to the knowledge that the robot has. So uh, this was uh, so this scheme was uh, more on an exploitation level that is called so basically the policy uh, learns to do the, the best action at every at every state but doesn't care much about uh, about learning to perform better. If we want to learn to perform better is when reinforcement learning comes into the scene and we have to uh, to explore in a, in a in a smart way so that the robot gains more knowledge of the task at hand. So instead of uh, the policy uh, the, uh, directly uh, executing the policy, uh, that, so executing the motion that has the best expected outcome, we get new data and this new data can be suboptimal or can be even bad. Uh, but the, the good thing about it is that uh, if, if we modify the, the motion that the robot is doing to achieve certain tasks, then um, 
then uh, the execution we can evaluate it and update the policy with the assessment of how uh, these uh, these uh, tasks with uh, some variations perform. So this is plugged back into the policy and new uh, motions of the robot can be done in a in a in a loop so that the robot uh, over experience learns to improve the task. This is similar to what, to what humans do. Yeah, as humans, so usually, when we learn to uh, imagine playing baseball, uh, we initially are taught by, uh, by someone how to move the bat, and then when someone throws the ball at us, usually at, 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 uh, in the beginning we will miss everything. But with experience, we perfect, uh, we perfect our ability and then learn to do it better. Of course, there's always external circumstances that can affect uh, the task. In the case of the baseball, uh, it would be where the ball is coming, what speed does it have, uh, which uh, exact uh, point around us will, will it hit. And so <clears throat> this is something that needs to be taken into account. Um, but uh, first of all, I want to uh, define what uh, what a policy uh, policy is in, and how do we represent it. So um, usually, uh, a policy is uh, what maps the states into into actions. And to define it, we can go back to uh, to the general reinforcement learning, in which usually Markov decision processes are used, and MTPs uh, are uh, usually these uh, tuples of states, actions, transitions, and rewards. So um, states is how the uh, the setup is. So imagine, for example, that I have a paper on my on my table, and I would I want to uh, I want to throw it into the garbage bin. So the state is that the paper is on the table, and uh, I can have several actions. For example, picking picking up the paper, and another action could be throwing it into the garbage bin. Of course, uh, these uh, different actions. Uh, have some prerequisites in this case. So uh, if I, I cannot throw the paper into the garbage bin if I don't have it in my, in my hands. Um, but uh, but uh, every state so can yield different, uh, can start, so every action, sorry, can start from different states. And then there's the transition. So if I throw the paper into the garbage bin, what is the probability that I will uh, hit the bin or it will go to the floor? So. Uh, the transitions are the probabilities that, uh, given the current state and, I, that, uh, and that I real, uh, realize certain action at the current state, what is the probability at ending up at uh, the state where the, the paper is on the garbage bin or the state where the paper is on the floor? And of course, the rewards. The rewards is how good the outcome of the action was. So if the paper falls into the garbage bin, then the reward will be high. We will have a good reward because we did what we wanted to do. And if the paper fell to the, on the ground, then we will have a, a bad reward because we didn't do, we wouldn't, we didn't, we didn't achieve our, our objective. And here's where uh, policies are defined. So the policy is the one that, given the states uh, and, and transitions uh, that we know, that we might know or we might not know, uh, decides which is the action that is the best. And saying the action that is the best is the action that, on average, will provide us with the best reward. So this uh, this is, uh, for example, defined with the value function, which is this v pi of s. So basically, uh, it is the expected reward given that we are now at the current state s, and we would apply policy pi. Also, there's the the cube function, which is uh, the expected reward of uh, being at state s apply, and applying action a following the the policy pi. Now, um, in, in robot motion learning, what we what happens is that uh, these states and actions, as I was mentioning, with the with the garbage with the paper and the garbage bin, are uh, discrete uh, sets of states and actions. So, in robot motion learning, um, this is not uh, discrete because the states are uh, in, uh, are, uh, are infinite. So, uh, it's a continuous state. So, there's more more to that and in reinforcement learning uh, uh, with this uh, with any kind of policy there's different approaches and some of them are uh, for example to learn the value fun this value function q uh, through experience and then uh, uh, ma maximize it so you find the, 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 the best policy the one that takes the best decisions is the one that uh, maximizes this expected reward also uh, we can learn the policy directly so without these value functions uh, by uh, using the uh, parameter, a set of parameters of the policy that, so some parameters that are within the function of the policy and that uh, map us these uh, states to actions. Or we can learn both, like in an actor critic, uh, uh, some actor critic methods. But in this case, in the robot motion learning, as I was mentioning, um, it is more interesting to use what's called direct policy search 
because um, the states are infinite, the actions are infinite because there are continuous state spaces. So basically, um, using uh, this direct policy search, we convert, uh, we, trans we convert the problem of kind of an optimization problem with respect to these parameters of the policy. Now, um, why using this type of policy search? As I was mentioning, it's continuous, high, uh, continuous state action spaces, but also the dimensionality is worse when you have to build this uh, graph of states and actions. Uh, if there's more dimensions uh, in, co like in, in coordinates or types of actions that you can do, everything gets more complicated. And also, real-time requirements of control or, or, or robot motion makes it more difficult to replan uh, trajectories. Also, uh, direct policy search uh, has faster conversions, and uh, you can also have uh, stochastic policies, and you have more control over the exploration parameters than in, in, the, in the other reinforcement learning. Uh, one negative part of it is that usually you will provide a prior knowledge to this direct policy search method, and this prior knowledge uh, will uh, somehow uh, set where are you going to look for. So the convergence will be probably be to a local uh, local optimal policy. Now, um, in order to uh, work uh, with uh, continuous uh, continuous state and action spaces, um, we have to reformulate the robot control as a reinforcement learning problem. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so basically, uh, in this case, the state space, uh, which was uh, uh, the, the semantic state of like the, the, the paper on my table, uh, now is the, probably the joint position of the, the joints of the robot, the pose of the end effector of the robot, or uh, any, any other thing like, like that. And then the actions can be the torque that we apply on the joints. It can be the acceleration commands that we want on the end effector. It can be the desired state uh, of the end effector, etc. And the control policy will map as this, the, the current state to uh, uh, to a certain uh, torque, acceleration, desired state, uh, etc. And this control policy can be stochastic, where uh, it assigns a probability to each one of the of the of the actions, or deterministic, where each uh, state maps into a single action. Then, of course, you can have the transition probability, which is the probability of going from one state to another, given that you apply um, the, the the action ut. <coughs> And then uh, uh, a sequence of uh, states and actions is what's called a trajectory, also known as rollout or path in certain uh, uh, publications. Uh, of course, uh, in order to, ha to do reinforcement learning, you need to evaluate the, the, the trajectory. So you will have a, a reward that usually consists on a terminal reward, which is related to the, to the achievement of the task, or time-step rewards that might depend on the state that you or the states that you go through, or which actions you take at certain states. If they are like if require very much effort, and so on. But in overall, what it, the, the optimal policy is again the one that maximizes the expected reward of a, of, a, of a robot motion given our policy. And so. Uh, how to how to represent policies? So, uh, when talking about policies in robot uh, motion learning, you need to talk to to, to think about uh, uh, characterizations of uh, trajectories, for example. And so, uh, you can have like uh, some data or trajectory data that you want to fit into a policy. In this case, you have like several very thin lines that represent. Uh, the different trajectories that are fed to the to the robot, and then the robot fits uh, for in this case a stochastic um, a stochastic representation of motion in which there are parts where there's more variance and there are parts where there's less variance, and the the parameters of this uh, of this uh, of this uh, model are the ones that represent the policy. So. Uh, some of the representations that are very popular are, for example, dynamic movement primitives. Probably some of you already heard about them. Uh, they were from uh, almost already 20 years ago. But uh, basically, uh, what they do is that they, uh, the, the desired acceleration is basically a second order dynamical uh, system that, that, that pushes the, the state to a goal. And then an excitation function, this f here, that basically what does is to it, it changes the shape of this uh, second order dynamical system. And this um, uh, excitation function is uh, the product of some like kernel matrix times uh, uh, so the parameters, which are the parameters of the policy. So the policy is the distribution of these parameters. 
Uh, another approach for uh, for representing the, the trouble motion is uh, probabilistic movement primitives. This is another type of uh, movement primitive in which uh, the state vector, which can be the, 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 in this case, for example, is the joint position, joint velocity, but it can be anything that related to the robot, is uh, also uh, some like a kernel, mat a kernel matrix uh, times a weight uh, vector. Uh, this is a linear uh, linear stochastic model and the, the good thing is that these weights uh, that uh, we can get a probability distribution in these weights and work on these weights uh, uh, so these weights map naturally to the, pro to the probability distribution of the trajectories like in two slides uh, ago like here so uh, these weights uh, map to the variance and mean at every time step now, other, there's uh, many other ways of representing uh, robot motion. For instance, uh, some people have been using Gaussian process models. Uh, thinking uh, in Gaussian process, or probably many of you already uh, also know about Gaussian process, but in Gaussian process, uh, what you have is that uh, it's a, you, you define a functional uh, over uh, some like random variables, and then uh, this uh, is very useful for fitting uh, fitting data without losing information, and without losing information because you define a kernel function that uh, stores the correlation between all the all the data points. This is good because you uh, keep more more information than in other methods, but uh, it has the inconvenience that uh, the this covariance matrix grows. Uh, with, with, the, with the amount of data, uh, data that you have. So uh, if you have n data, then this covariance matrix will, ha will be size n times n. And in order to do a prediction, you need to do an inverse of this matrix. So, uh, so the, computational, the computational cost grows uh, quite heavily. Um, in the case that we have, uh, so the problem uh, with uh, Gaussian processes for representing uh, robot motion is also that uh, you can have, like as I showed with the probabilistic movement primitives, um, there are parts of a trajectory where the robot can have more variance, meaning that uh, the, the position is not very important at that part of the trajectory. And in Gaussian processes, um, the the samples are assumed usually uh, the most common Gaussian process are the samples are assumed to be to have the equal uh, uh, noise variance, which is, is stands for kind of like the measuring noise. So it is expected that the first, for the same input you would have similar output. And when you provide uh, samples with very large variance, then what will happen is that um, this will create a very large uh, uh, inference on the on this noise variance that will will create the effect of the middle graph where uh, the variance is not uh, well fit but rather kind of an offset uh, very homogeneous on the contrary there are uh, versions of the of Gaussian process which con consider time varying uh, noise variance like a stochastic GP uh, in any case, uh, if you're interested in Gaussian process, I recommend you to check on the GP flow libraries for, for Gaussian process. It is uh, very well documented and very easy to use. Um, but then, uh, which is the motion representation that is the best uh, amongst these or amongst any other? It, it depends on, on, on the case. So for stochasticity, um, this, the, among these the examples that I mentioned, uh, probabilistic movement primitives and Gaussian process uh, uh, can represent stochastic data. Uh, they, this means that they can add like buyer points and condition, and it's very easy to condition on certain points. Uh, but uh, for example, Gaussian process are more difficult to fit usually because they uh, need to go through an optimization problem as uh, the, the, the parameters inside the kernel are the ones that need to be optimized with respect to the data. And regarding the, uh, the parametric model, uh, probabilistic movement primitives and dynamic movement primitives have uh, more parameters that, uh, that need to be tuned uh, by hand, basically, heuristically, which are, for example, the, 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 the position of the kernels over time, the, the width, uh, those, uh, there's also a couple of parameters more in the DMPs, uh, which are gains on the dynamics equation. On the contrary, uh, in the Gaussian processes, what you need to, uh, to put by hand is uh, what functional do you, will you use for the kernel and what type of, um, of Gaussian process you're using. There's uh, many more motion representations, so feel free to ask if you uh, have like suggestions or questions regarding them. Um, and then uh, once we have the policy representation, which again uh, is this uh, movement primitive that will define the, the trajectory uh, through their parameters, 
uh, we can um, we can learn we, we want to learn and improve these parameters uh, so uh, if for example in the case of the probabilistic movement primitive the the policy is basically the mean and covariance of the set of parameters and in Gaussian processes uh, it will be the, uh, the, the, the the kernel and the hyper parameters that have been optimized for the kernel and in the DMP will be the, the, the parameters also uh, that are multiplied by the kernel but when we want to improve them we uh, run more samples and we evaluate them and we try to update the model and there's different ways of doing it and we could categorize it more or less in three uh three types one of them is policy gradients in which basically we 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 find the gradient of the of that j which is the expected reward given the policy so we find that the gradient of this policy of the expe expected reward with respect to the policy parameters and then we update it with a with a learning rate then we can also do uh, expectation maximization which basically converts the learning problem into an inference problem a statistical inference problem usually in these cases there are no learning rates but it requires more computational cost and uh, and is more complex to, to evaluate and then uh, there's also uh, information theoretic approaches which are based on information theory and i want to uh, show an example of these methods uh, which is um, uh, relative entropy policy search in which uh, the, the they solve this problem and this optimization problem is basically so the first equation is the one uh, that is uh, most common which is maximize the expected reward instead of a sum it's uh, it's uh, the, the integral because we are in a continuous state so basically <clears throat> uh, maximize the integral of uh, the probability of every uh, weight that we could uh, uh, that we could uh, obtain from the probability distribution of the weights times uh, the, its associated reward. Uh, but this is subject to this constraint that means that um, we bound the Kullback library divergence with respect uh, between sorry between the new policy that we will obtain the new policy parameters and the previous policy parameters. And this is because in robotics, um, being very greedy in learning uh, policies, it, it can be very dangerous because the robot is moving and if you change a lot the policy, you will change a lot your motion, the motion, and you don't know what you will find if the robot changes a lot uh, the motion. He will run into maybe a, a joint limits or he will, could hit something around. So we want uh, the policies that to change uh in smaller amounts and these smaller amounts can be tuned with, with this parameter epsilon and of course the last uh, the last uh, line which is that the, that the policy is, is a probability distribution now <clears throat> going again to the to the to the to the schema that i was showing before there's also external circumstances the circumstances that can affect uh, our policy so basically anything that can happen around the robot can affect its performance and uh, we need to take that into, into consideration um, for instance uh, there's some reinforcement learning methods that can be adapted to context variables uh, context variable is something that we can see or measure um, in the in our surroundings for example if you want to pick up pick up an object so the position of that object could be a context variable or um or well if we want to throw the, that paper into the garbage bin the position of the garbage bin could be uh, could be a context variable uh so these context variables can be added to the motion characterization too in order to uh in order to make this dependency uh on the on the parameters in this case uh, in this in this plot, what is done is that the the, the motion is learned with a higher variance, and uh, the con but has some uh, contextual dependency, and that is used to tune the, the motion. Uh, okay, an example of that is in this case. Um, what we did was to teach a robot uh, uh, to feed a human. And we use two types of food, so there is two two different actions. One of them is uh, pinching a piece of apple, and the uh, and the other is uh, scooping a, a little bit of uh, proxy soup and feeding it, feeding it to the person. So we used a, mi a, a mixture of two, uh, in this case, uh, probabilistic movement primitives. And uh, again, we did uh, kinesthetic teaching, which is basically putting the robot in uh, gravity compensation and uh, moving it and recording the data that we are using. Uh, in order to fit the, the model. So here you can see that the, the, the two actions of the two, the two plates are uh, slightly different. And uh, we got all the data without labeling, 
uh, the, and so what with, for example, uh, topological methods, we could detect uh, how many distingui dis distingu distinguishable actions there were. So with this kind of model, what we could do was first uh, uh, execute some uh, uh, some trajectories of feeding autonomously after learning and uh, feeding the human. In this case, the context variables are the position of the plates. So the robot is adapting to the changing uh, position of the plates and the head of the human but also there's a context variable which is the the preference on what food the the human the human what well in this case the mannequin wants so uh, with that we can feed the human and also uh, given a motion we can condition uh, our model in that motion and, and infer what was the position of the of the plate and the action to be done these kind of methods can also be applied uh, Okay. can also be applied to other kinds of actions like handwriting with a, with a data set in, in this case um, we had uh, some letters uh, so the data set of handwriting letters and we fit this kind of model and the good thing about this kind of model which is a, a mixture of um, of pro MPs represented by uh, pro MP parameters and context variables so we find the joint distribution of the pro MP parameters and the context variables so that we can condition uh, the pro MP on the uh, context variable or find the context variable given the prompt P that we have run. So that's how you can infer what is the context given a, a, a trajectory that you have. But uh, again, so adaptability also uh, provides, uh, as, you, as you have seen in that, in that video, adaptability requires you to make more samples, provide more, uh, more information and ev basically everything adds sample complexity. And, I haven't talked yet about sample complexity. So, sample complexity is the amount of samples that you need uh, to provide the system in order it, for it to learn properly. And this is a very crucial uh, aspect because uh, if you check um, uh, some like uh, vision, uh, uh, vision research and so on, they have millions and millions and billions of uh, pictures in order to learn uh, their computer vision uh, algorithm and and so on, and banks have millions of data. Amazon has your uh, has more data of, about you than you that you know. Uh, they can fit very good models using uh, data greedy models like deep learning, which is uh, very good for for using these huge amounts of data. However, in robotics, there's this problem that uh, not everything can be. Um, simulated not uh, all data is available available sometimes in certain tasks uh, we don't have uh, huge amounts of data but rather instead of having millions of data we have um, tens of data tw uh, 20 20 samples 50 samples um, 20 hundred samples it's already very much in a, in a in a robot in a robot learning system because um, it costs a lot to to do robot motion in this sense um, there's things that add sample complexity and, uh, for example, the motion representation can add sample complexity if your motion representation is too redundant in the sense that uh, it has more parameters that is needed, this can uh, require you to provide it uh, with more data than you actually would uh, with another method. Also, uncertainty on the environment. So the, the uncertainty of running a certain action and not knowing exactly what will happen in the real world also adds sample complexity because we need to learn how, uh, how we deviate with respect to this uh, changing environment. The adaptability that, that I have been showing, so the changing the position of the place <coughs> adds sample complexity also if you if we want to provide the robot with rich information about how are the precision requirements of the task like in the problem p plot that i was showing before this also adds more complexity and if you want to learn the dynamics of the ro of the robots or the reward on the fly this also adds more complexity so how to do everything efficiently so uh, apply the prior knowledge that you have on the system uh, if you don't want to be uh, like very general, you can uh, restrict a bit your problem in order to achieve uh, more success. Also, if you feel that your models have uh, are too high dimensional, um, or your but the environment is is also very high dimensional, you can uh, try to reduce the dimension of the problem and work in a in a in a smaller problem that will be probably easier to solve, and then project upwards to the full system. Also, you can choose uh, what, where to sample. So in this uh, 
uh, probabilistic Bohmer primitives, what is usually done is this uh, probability distribution on the, on the policy weights. They, it is, they generate um, random samples there. But what if instead of generating random samples, I look for the sample that uh, would provide me the most information that will be very useful and maybe it will save me from running the, moving the robot more times. And also transfer learning, meaning that if you can learn something on another system that is very similar and you can transfer it to the, to the robot, so that we uh, save a little bit of time too. <clears throat> so, uh, in plugging prior knowledge uh, in policy search, uh, there's uh, not only uh, what I've been showing the uh, model free approaches where you just uh, run, uh, egg, so run the code with, uh, <coughs> with the demonstrations that you have. And, uh, and do not model it anything on the, on the environment. So uh, you can do model-based policy search in which you can learn uh, either the dynamics of the, of the system that you're manipulating or the dynamics of the system or the, of the robot or the transitions uh, on, on the states of the robot. But you can also um, model the, the, the reward that you will get. So if you run uh, several, several uh, motions and you can get the reward of, from them, you can maybe build a model of the reward because usually um, the reward is something that um, that we in, that is in G can, kind of defined heuristically for certain tasks. So you will build a function and after every execution you will I say, okay, um, we evaluate the function that I invented because I think that if I want to throw the paper into the garbage bin, the reward function will be how close uh, the ball landed uh, to the garbage bin. But um, this is a little bit uh, unelegant, you might say. So there's uh, methods for learning this reward function, um, like inverse reinforcement learning, uh, in which uh, you, for example, provide uh, some uh, expert demonstrations to the robot and then the robot builds a uh, uh, kind of a model of the good uh, perf good performing uh, kind of motions and from there it finds a manifold of, uh, of, uh, of robot behaviors that performs well. Um, again, <clears throat> in in this, in usually, usually the reward is uh, the reward function can be evaluated by measuring the output of the of the of, of the of the scene, but uh, it is not usually a very uh, a direct uh, mapping from the model parameters uh, to the reward. So it's kind of like a black box from where we measure some things and then we extract the value. So uh, you can we can also learn both the dynamics of the system and the reward, and uh, this will help us. Uh, this will help our robot to learn faster. And one of the things that I was uh, telling you about uh, how to like gain some gain in sample complexity is to use dimensionality reduction. In using dimensionality reduction, so imagine that we build a policy representation of the motion of the robot, and uh, in order to capture the variance of it, we we need to use a problem P with uh, 15 uh, uh, 15 uh, Gaussian kernels per degree of freedom. Uh, this this will add up, and if you have like 14 um, 14 degrees of freedom of between the two robots, uh, will be over 200 uh, 200 samples. Uh, two, sorry, 200 uh, dimensions uh, in the in our in our uh, policy representation. That is a little bit intractable because um, again. Um, for for instance, if you if you want to map the covariance of this uh, of these uh, policy representation, the covariance of those parameters will be of dimension two hundred. And if you want to to fill this uh, this matrix with information, you'll need at least two hundred samples. So uh, this tells us that there's uh, that we cannot uh, fill the information of very high parametric models and so on. Sorry, uh, there was an interruption. Uh, what was I? Okay, uh, so basically, um, by projecting the uh, the representation that is very high dimensional into a lower dimensional space, uh, we can um, we can make the problem faster, and we can also learn information about how the um, the different degrees of freedom correlate each other, and we can use it later for uh, little space control by augmenting the redundancy of the task. 
Now, uh, an example of uh, dimensionality reduction that is not purely a dimensionality reduction method is that in some cases you can have um, symmetry patterns between the between the demonstrations. So, in the case of uh, folding a piece of cloth, what you see is that uh, there is a symmetry between the two arms, and we, if we can put like a symmetry surface between them, we can we can have the motion instead of representing it by the motion of the two arms, represent the motion of one arm and project it uh, and mirror it with this uh, symmetry uh, surface. This allows us to reduce the dimensionality uh, pretty, uh, pretty much. And uh, in the case we have data sets of uh, motions for the both arms, uh, we can also find these uh, symmetry patterns and project one arm to the other. So instead of having the parameters of two arms, you have the parameters of uh, one arm's motion. Uh, this can also be done in like non-planar surfaces, surfaces, but again, uh, in that in that case, when you would try to keep the the variance profiles, the problem you have is that everything deformates and uh, covariance ellipsoids become banana ellipsoids. So, in order to do that, we can have to find. Um, a covariance ellipsoid that more or less fits a banana and we can do that by uh, for instance uh, in, this, in this paper what we did was to uh, use the eigen decomposition of the, uh, of the covariance ellipsoid and the curvature of the surface in order to uh, project one uh, ellipsoid to the other side um, in general this method for example is uh, that uh, we have this probabilistic movement primitive and we have the parameters of the uh, symmetry surface and with that, we sample just for one trajectory, and we see, we get the second trajectory by using the symmetry surface by measuring it, and then we execute the motion and we evaluate a reward that is associated with the weights of one trajectory and the way the, the parameters of um, of the symmetry surface. With that, we can use a policy search method and update the, and update the policy, the policy that consists on this the the weights of the PMP plus the um, parameters on the symmetry surface. Uh, we tried that and it actually worked much better and we gained uh, performance so that the, the, we achieved uh, an optimal behavior uh, with, uh, with like much less samples. So this provides us uh, uh, with, with, with a gain with respect to the sample complexity. Um, and this is the kind of motion that we did. For the, for the experimentation, and uh, it was about folding uh, a piece of cloth. Mm -hmm. Now, there's uh, other uh, dimensionality reduction methods, like uh, we can have like the degrees of freedom of one robot and um, project it to uh, a smaller dimensional uh, space, which is kind of like a virtual degrees of freedom that uh, that can be mapped uh, upwards and backwards with this uh, projection matrix, matrix uh, omega. Uh, this can be used in DMPs or ProMPs or any linear model that we can have. And in this case, we applied it to uh, folding uh, clothes with two, uh, with two arms. We used the controller in the Cartesian space. We placed the arms according to some like placing algorithms, and we applied. Uh, we did we did move the robots with a compliant controller for uh, of which I will, I will talk later. And using this methodology, we could actually um, achieve a, a better performance. So, um, so here, uh, first of all, we were teaching the humans. Um, well, the humans were practicing a little bit uh, how to fold the polo in order to do the demonstration because folding a polo with just a pinch grasp is not as easy. Uh, maybe Julia will talk about it, but uh, then. Uh, the one who did better, who was me, uh, trained the robot with kinesthetic teaching, and from there on, the robot was running uh, executions and trying to improve the motion. We have we had um, a rooftop camera that was basically measuring, uh, in this case, uh, how squared the 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 the, 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 fold, the the folded cloth was on the on the table. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, it was not measuring how wrinkled it was. So basically, the, the robot actually learned uh, to, to put it pretty squared, and as its projection pretty square, but not uh, unwrinkled. Uh, this is again the. Um, then we could run it in a, in a compliant behavior. Uh, this is again uh, why I was um, telling you that the importance of the uh, reward of building the reward function. So we built a reward function in which the wrinkleness of the result was not important, and we realized, okay, so basically, if we do not tell the robot to uh, have the, the cloth flat, then it will actually have the cloth very squared but wrinkled. Um, 
Okay. Other approaches that use dimensionality reduction are uh, th those like in this paper where we used uh, what's called Gaussian process latent variable models. Uh, in these Gaussian process latent variable models, uh, what we did was to use an extension of the Gaussian process that is used to reduce the dimensionality of a problem. Um, this is very interesting because uh, in Usually in dimensionality reduction methods, uh, what, uh, what the methods look for is uh, they look for a mapping that maps the variables to a latent space uh, that uh, in which we keep the most information from the original data. But in this case, uh, the, the, the method doesn't look for a mapping, but rather uh, finds directly optimizes for the, the latent space variables that, that, uh, that contain the most of the information, so that have the less information loss with respect to the data. And this is a very aggressive way of them producing the dimensionality, uh, although uh, it, has, uh, it can have like computational um, it can be computationally more costly. And what we did in here was, uh, so basically we had, uh, in green, we had some trajectories, which were like the, the input, our knowledge of the, of the task. And we did this um, high, we, we uh, put it in this high dimensional space of uh, parameters, uh, of policy parameters. We could weight them uh, with methods, uh, with different weight methods for giving importance to the trajectories and then project it to this latent space, which is much smaller dimension. We are talking that uh, about uh, projecting from dimension, uh, if, I if I remember correctly, maybe dimension 70 to dimension 2 or 3. So uh, it's a very like factor of 30 in the dimensionality reduction. And there, in this very small uh, uh, policy representation, very small dimension policy representation, we could actually do uh, uh, do this uh, reinforcement learning. And actually in this case, what we did was to use uh, Bayesian optimization in order to find the samples that we would provide the most information to our model. So uh, that in that way, uh, we would, uh, we would uh, go in this loop and uh, try to get to use the less the less samples as possible and regarding Bayesian optimization um, also uh, probably many of you already know about Bayesian optimization but in Bayesian optimization uh, you set a, a, an acquisition function that tells you how good the knowledge uh, of, of, uh, of a certain function that you want to feed is and then uh, you uh, you get you sample there and gain knowledge in that region of the of, of the of the domain of the function that we want to fit. In this case, the function that we wanted to fit is the reward. So basically, the mapping from the latent space to the reward, so that we can know where the best rewards are in the latent space, and then project it upwards to the full space. And uh, aside from this, uh, there's other methods I I would like to talk about, but uh, I I don't think I can because of time restrictions. But for example, um, transfer learning is very important. I think I already mentioned it. Um, uh, basically, uh, being able to uh, acquire some knowledge uh, on, on one robot or from a human and transfer it to the robot by uh, mapping, for instance, uh, the joints or learning methods that can uh, learn to efficiently transfer this according to some like performance indicator. Uh, in this case, we we did transfer learning from a human with an accents uh, uh, suit, which was which is a motion capture suit that maps these uh, sensors uh, converts it to a 3D model of a human. So we were able to uh, imitate a human with this uh, with the Tiago robot. So and we could uh, teach the robot to perform certain tasks. This is also very useful uh, in order to demonstrate uh, tasks to a, to a robot. So basically, if you want, uh, aside from kinesthetic teaching, this is an alternative to teach robots. Uh, another thing that I, I wanted to talk about is, for instance, a very hot Sorry, topic. Yeah. Yeah, you have three questions here. I think perhaps you can answer them. Or oh, okay. Have to go uh, I'll do a couple more slides and I'll answer them. Okay. okay. Uh, for instance, uh, this is a very hot topic lately, the Hindsight Experience Replay. Um, this is used uh, both in deep learning and robot motion learning, uh, but the, the interesting insight uh, on, the, on her is that uh, you assume that uh, the fail executions that you did, so you do uh, you do a motion of the robot and the output is not good, but then you, what you can do is that assume that okay the the, the, the end the, the end state that I reached with this bad uh, execution uh, 
uh, what if I consider that it was actually my target? So you change the data so that your target now, it was the, the end situation and say, okay, if my static situation is this one, I apply this policy and my target is the one that, that I ended up with, then it, I can assign good reward to this. So with that, you provide more richness to the data set. So it's something that you need uh, to consider. Uh, and also uh, in, in, in sample complexity, there are different ways uh, you can you can get you can gain information about the the, the robot motion learning. Uh, in this case, so this is a very uh, good scheme. You can, for example, learn the dynamics on the left. You can learn the rewards on the right. Your policies in the middle, and you can provide priors to the dynamics. Uh, you can. Uh, model it uh, with uh, certain parameters that you can optimize. You can also provide a prior on the expected re re rewards and do a Bayesian optimization to find the samples that will provide you with more information of it. And in your policy, you can put prior in structures, um, like in the Gaussian process, or a prior on the parameters, uh, like in the probabilistic moving primitive, where from demonstrations you fit the initial models. In, G in Gaussian process, from the dem from, from well, you set uh, the kernel uh, functional that you will use. Now I will answer uh, some questions uh, that I have. Uh, let me see. Okay, um, Mario oh, said, Mario. Yeah. yeah, implementation wise, what do you mean by applying prior knowledge on the system? So yeah, um, implementation. Prior knowledge means uh, data, basically. Uh, data or um, or the shape of uh, the policy, as I was mentioning. So um, if it's going to be, a, the, the, the policy will be a Gaussian process or the policy will be a moving primitive, uh, what kernel will the Gaussian process have? What data you will use to initialize the, 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 the robot motion learning? Because again, uh, learning a task of robot motion without any prior knowledge, any demonstration, then it's uh, you cannot do that in the real world. You can do that in simulation and so on. And you see those videos where the the the, the, the robot is like shaking uh, very much in the first like I don't know uh, two thousand iterations until it reaches something that it makes a little bit of sense. But usually you will provide a little bit of information, like a, a few demonstrations to the robot, like this is more or less how I want you to do it. And from there on, you can learn to improve it. Um, Okay, so Peter uh, says, how do you pick which trajectory gets trans uh, transposed using symmetry? Is it always, for example, from left down to right? Is there any consideration to which? Um, that's a good question. Uh, usually, um, you can, yeah, so as, the, as this, like, kind of fittings are computationally fast, you can, like, check to both of the projections, but uh, I don't think it's very, it would make very difference, for example, in the planar symmetries. Mm -hmm. Ignacio says, is it recommended to first to learn first the simulator directly in a real scenario? How can you avoid the robot seeing your hands modifying the robot pose? Okay. Um, so if you have a simulator, of course, it can be useful. And the thing is, uh, if a simulator is good, then even better. Um, the the thing is that, of course, when you go from simulation to reality, there will be changes and uh so i don't want to roast uh, the vision uh, research uh, or so but uh, in vision uh, they usually work on simulation because or yeah, they basically use benchmarks for everything and uh, there's not uh, that much amount of vision researches that go to the like real world scenarios which is which always has more complications um, but in robotics, of course, uh, if you want to learn a policy on the simulation and then transfer it to the real robot, then it's great because you provided the robot with more information. And of, but of course, consider that if you were you had converged already in simulation, you will maybe have to, have to synthetically add variants to the policy so that the robot starts exploring again. Because in the real scenario, uh, it will require uh, to, to explore more. Um, Ignacio, uh, you also said, uh, how, about, how can you avoid the robot seeing your hands modifying the robot pose? Okay, so when doing kinesthetic teaching, you can um, you can record data in different ways. So one of them would be to uh, record the end effect or uh, position by uh, doing the forward kinematics and recording the joint position. That would be the easier one, and you would have no um, 
no uh, occlusions uh, in your knowledge. Also, uh, with uh, with this motion capture system, you can um, you can capture the motion, and you can you can see uh, that you have on your computer on your computer what you have sent to the robot. In the case that you're using vision, of course, uh, you have to be careful uh, with. Uh, with uh, with you occluding the the, the robot because um, if you occlude the, the, the robot then um, of course you will probably miss some parts of the of the trajectory but you can maybe interpolate between them and then have the robot uh, learn uh, learn yes uh, so I had like lots of more material but um, just uh, to uh, just to do a couple more slides. Um, you, uh, I have been talking about uh, robot motion learning and, and basically policy representations uh, at, the, at, the position, at, the, at the position level velocity, but uh, when you work in a human environment, <clears throat> uh, you need to take into, take into account the control because you don't want the robot to hurt anyone. So, for instance, uh, in, you can uh, teach a robot to put a scarf on a mannequin and you can Okay, put, I put the robot in kinesthetic teaching, I record the end effector poses of the robot, and then um, I build this, uh, in this case it was a dynamic motion primitive, and then the robot can execute this motion. But the problem is that the robot is very strong, and it's, um, the, its control might be very rigid. So uh, if the mannequin moves, uh, then uh, the robot can hurt the mannequin. So it might be not something that we don't want to do. So we have to look for uh, what's called compliant controllers. And compliant controllers are, are some kind of controllers in which, uh, by using the knowledge that we have uh, on the dynamics of the robot, we can um, adapt them so that they do the just the necessary torque to move the robot. And then if a human interacts with it, the robot will accommodate to the perturbation of the human. This is also something that is uh, of, a, of a high importance because uh, in if we don't want to keep the the, the 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 robots in in in, in jails. I I, uh, I mean, in, like in factories where they have like the the areas where the robots are, uh, the humans cannot enter these areas and so on. We need to take these control uh, aspects into account. And um, yeah, so basically, I think yeah that would be enough for today. Um, Thank you very much for your attention. Now, if you have any other question, I think we have like uh, five minutes or so. So, thank you, Adria. Thank you very much. We have five more minutes for any questions. I think you answer all the questions of the chat. Okay. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Have a nice day. Thanks.